So um, I think it was Friday. Uh, I was in my my office at home, and uh, the kids the kids were in the house. The grandkids were in the house, and they were making. I could hear them, and then I I couldn't hear them, and I I assume they were taking naps, and so I waited a while, and I came out of the room, and I couldn't find them. Now Jody was there. I couldn't find her either, and. Uh, so I thought, well, they're, they're all sleeping. So, so I went around, and they weren't here, and they weren't there. And, and I thought, well, maybe they're downstairs in the play area playing with toys. And so I went boom, 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 downstairs. Nobody was there. And I thought, they went in the van, and they went somewhere. And I went and looked in the driveway. The van was there. And I thought, I couldn't have missed a rapture. There's, There's... <laughs> No way. I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know what I did. Revelation is kind of intimidating, isn't it? Can I just, you know, revelation can be t intimidating uh, to go through. And we're just kind of taking a skim on the top of it here. But I think it's an important thing for us to do. Uh, a couple weeks ago, we talked about the throne room. And uh, that was kind of the introduction to Jesus in in Revelation, and we then after that we talked. That was in chapter four, and in chapter three, two and three, we talked about the churches, but particularly the church of Laodicea, and we talked about some things. That was a the church that that it was said, "Don't I don't want you to be lukewarm, hot or cold. I I, I want you to be one or the other, but don't go in the middle of it. Don't go in the middle. I I want you to be hot. I want you to be on fire for God." All right. How many think that's a good idea? Being on fire for God, having passionate about what we uh, believe. And today I want to talk about, uh, uh, this is a subject where I'm, I'm just anticipating a lot of amens, all right? The tribulation period. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> that's just what I thought right there. Um, in the morning minute with Mitch, I had... Uh, one of the, the days that we talked about was, it was Vince Lombardi, the death of Vince Lombardi. He was a famous coach. There's, there's a big award that's given with his name on it to uh, football teams. And I went through some of the things that he said, like, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. Perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. It's not whether you get knocked down. It's whether you get up. Winners never quit, and quitters never. Winning is a habit. Unfortunately, so is. Winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. Okay, I don't know. There's a bunch more of these. I don't know if you agree with all that or not, but here's one thing he had said. If you're not 15 minutes early, you're, you're late. And I, I thought about that, and I, I thought, you know, what does the Bible say about being on time. One of the things in The Chosen that we keep hearing, you know, is when is this going to happen, Jesus? When are you going to take power? When are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? And he, he'll say things like, soon. Well, that's a time, the time for that discussion is later. And, and it's like, but they're wanting to know when and times and, uh, and all of these kind of things, all things doing the time. But in the Bible, it's not so much about when, but it's more about who. It's not so, so much about exactly when is something going to happen. It's more about who do you believe in. And that's really what Revelation is mostly about. World conditions uh, today, Mac listed a couple of things here, but and I'll read a couple more a little bit later. But it's probably a good time to just brush up on what Revelation has to say to us. What do you think when you hear the term, the, revel, the, uh, the tribulation period? What thoughts come to your mind when you hear that? Uh, I think back to a play. Uh, first, I was first part of it in Joliet called Heaven's Gates, Hell's Flames. Has anybody heard of that play? Have any of you acted in that play? Yeah. I got cast as Butch every time in that play. I was sitting with my lunchbox and my hard hat on. Um, but that was, a, that was a little bit about, and it was a little bit scary and maybe a little bit frightening to some, uh, what that was all about. But I sometimes think about that. So 
let's, uh, let's just take a couple of kind of big picture points here today in talking about um, what the Bible has to say about times as they progress. And I don't know if you, I, I kind of watch things that are happening and look for warning signs because while we don't know the exact time of things, there are indicators that are happening and paying attention to those is a good idea. So event number one, Christ will come and take his followers to heaven. Now there should be an amen there. Let me tell you why, because you don't wanna be here when the tribulation period hits. You wanna be gone. And, uh, and here's, a, here's just a, a side thought as I was thinking about this. My, my thinking is heaven is gonna feel like home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. I've listed, said the words to this song uh, several times, but uh, I think heaven is going to feel like home. We kind of wonder what's it going to be like. I was a, a little while ago, went back to a, uh, a family reunion on my, grandf my, my mother's side of the family, and they had traced the lineage back to Ireland on that side of, of the family. And, and I went to my grandfather's grave, I went to some grave sites and visited, went by our old house. You know, there's a feeling when you get back to home, it's like, well, this is where I grew up. There's things here that I remember. There's things about home. I think when we get to heaven, we're gonna say, this feels like home uh, to me. But here's what it says in 1 Corinthians. It will take only a second, as quickly as an eye blinks, when the last trumpet sounds. Those who have died will be raised forever, and we will all be changed. We're going to be clothed with immortality. There is an amen in there, I think. All right, how about this? No more pain. No more disease. No more sickness. No more disability. No more suffering. I went and visited Don Getch in the house, in, up at the hospital yesterday. He's up in Mendota. Took a pretty hard fall. And, you know, you just say, I'm going to be so glad when that doesn't happen anymore. He's got stitches, you know, and uh, a banged up shoulder and um, other things. Actually, a cracked skull. Uh, and his skull's pretty hard. <laughs> I, I'd say that to him, all right. So, Our resurrected bodies will be indestructible. Yes, and incorruptible as well. Yes, and it says, it tells us, death will be swallowed up in victory. No more, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and the voice of the archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. You know, we watched Wednesday night in The Chosen. You should be part of The Chosen, even if you've seen it before. Talking about it together, I think, is there's something that we learn a little better. But uh, the, this last week, we watched Jesus command out a demoniac from somebody. And, you know, most of the time, as we see Jesus, he's teaching and he's going, yes, but this is for another time. And um, we're going to go here and, you know, you're going to see this. And, and he's talking. But when that moment came, he came rushing in and said, out, come out and the demoniac left. There is a commanding power that Jesus has. There's a gentle, there's a gentle loving, but he is, make no mistake, there's commanding power there with the sound of a trumpet. In the big band, we have a row of saxophones, and then behind the saxophones, the ones that make our ears bleed, the brass players, the trumpet players. When we mic the big band, when we mic it up, we only mic the saxophones because the trumpets will either carry into the sax mics or depending on the size of the room or whether it's outdoors or indoors, will just carry. A, trump, a trumpet is loud and it was loud in the days when this was written. Uh, we're not gonna miss this uh, sign. Everybody will hear it. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So what should we do? Encourage one another with these words. 
Jesus came the first time, it was kind of a whisper. Remember? Manger. Just really a, a few people that we know of really came. You know, we depict she, uh, uh, wise men coming, but that was really later, really. It makes a nice story when you kind of compact it all together. But it's hard in the movies to wait a couple years and then have them come. Um, there, was, there was just, you know, a, f a few shepherds got the word from angels, and they said, let's go see, what, let's go see what's going on here. But there wasn't some big, uh, the Messiah has come. Let's all, let's the whole city of Jerusalem go and see him. It was kind of a whisper. Not the next time. The next time will be with authority and power. And I think a little volume will know it. There will be no mistake. You know, there was another time when Jesus uh, used his voice kind of loudly, all right? Probably a couple times, but I'm thinking of a particular one. There was a friend of his that died, was put in a tomb. And you remember, Jesus wept because the, the ladies were in such sorrow. And then what did he say? Lazarus! Come forth. How about the day when he says, Mitchell, come forth. Put your own name in there. Come forth. Oh, caught up with the Lord. Graves are going to break open, and I don't think it's going to be like in the movies where it's real scary. I think it's going to be, it's going to be a happy time. Um, and here's the thing. I think we will recognize each other. Even though we'll have hair and we will be a perfect weight. Even though those things, we'll still recognize each other. Sometimes when you go to funerals and they have all the pictures up, you know, you see somebody when they're really young and you go, Wow, that's what they look like when they got married. Oh, uh, and this and that. We have, today we have Jody's, uh, the memorial service for her brother. And so we've been going through pictures. So if she's a little weepy today, <laughs> we haven't been fighting, okay? <laughs> it's, uh, it's we're, we've been reliving some of that. Now there's a little bit of disagreement. Now today's kind of titled Timeline Part One, all right? So there's a little disagreement about this, and I'll tell you kind of where I stand on it. There, some people believe that um, the rapture, which simply means when, when Jesus calls his people home, the one, he, he calls us home to heaven, um, that it happens before the tribulation. The tribulation is a seven-year period that you don't want to go through. Nobody wants to go through that. It's where evil is unleashed. The second three and a half years worse than the first three and a half years. But some people believe that when Jesus, when the rapture takes place, it's going to be just before the tribulation period. Some believe it will happen right, at the, right in the middle of it. All right. And some people think that Christians will go through it and it won't happen until the end. Um, I believe it will happen at the beginning, up front, and that Christians won't go through that. But there will be people who have heard the word of God and kind of rejected it that when they see things after the fact, they will say, oh my, it was all true. And then some will make a decision at that point to follow Christ, but they won't be raptured at that very moment. They will go through uh, the tribulation. Um, uh, here's, here's what it says in uh, Thessalonians. I'm in Thessalonians 5, and I'm jumping around here just a little bit. Now concerning the times and the seasons, the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Sudden destruction will come upon them, and they will not escape. But since we belong to the day, the day as opposed to the night, light rather than darkness, uh, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there will be waves of destruction, seven years, very bad. There's been a warning. Um, 
and, and this part of Revelations is probably written more for unbelievers than for believers. But we need to stay kind of tuned into it. Now, number two, the tribulation, evil unrestrained. And God warned us over and over again about this. So number one, Christ is coming. He's going to take his followers with him. Number two, in the tribulation period, evil will be unrestrained. Not trying to scare you. Not, not trying to scare the heaven. Just trying to tell you what is really uh, the facts here. And you know, the Bible tells us over and over again that Satan wants to deceive us. He wants to trick us. Uh, it's his tactic. And one of the tactics is in a counterfeit trinity. And that's kind of what we see here in Revelation. So what does that mean? Well, the dragon, uh, which it talks about in the scripture, is the anti-God. So in the Bible, we're told over and over again, God says, I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be their God. They will be my people. But Satan wants to be, be our God and he wants us to be his servants or under him. He wants that position. He's wanted that position, wants people to worship him, to idolize him. He wants to be in the position of God. He's the anti-God. Some people think that one world religion is kind of wrapped up in this. Let me read uh, in Revelations what it says here. I witnessed in heaven another significant event. I saw a large red dragon, the dragon is the anti-God, with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns, and his tail swept away one-third of the stars. One-third of the stars in the sky, and he threw them to the earth, and he stood in front of the woman as she was about to give birth, ready to devour her baby as soon as it was born. Stars are angels. One-third of the angels went with Lucifer, the devil, Satan, swept. He, he convinced him. He deceived them. They went with him. But the good news is two-thirds are still with God, all right? Mary, some people think Mary meant Mary. Some people think Mary means Israel, the nation, God's followers. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, and it had seven heads, ten horns, with ten crowns on its head, and written on each head were names that blasphemed God. And the beast looked like a leopard, but it had the feet of a bear and the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne, and great authority. Remember, God gave Jesus his own power and his own crown and his own authority. And I saw one of the heads of the beast seem, like, seem wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. This is going to convince a lot of people when they see somebody dead raise again, indisputably. Seem, a fatal wound was healed, and the whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. He rose again. They worshiped the dragon for giving the beast such power, and they also worshiped the beast. Who is this great? Who is great as this beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against us? Now, let me ask, has is, is anybody else ever, when you read this maybe for the first time, went, huh? Anybody else went, huh? I did. It was like, Okay, let's go back to the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> you know, that I can understand. Remember, Revelation is about symbols and numbers. If you get the symbols and you get the numbers, you get Revelation. If you don't get that, it's pretty confusing. Um, but this is all about this, this false trinity, this anti-God trinity. And we sing, how great is our God, but, but, but the false trinity wants us to sing, how great is the beast. The beast was allowed to speak great blasphemies against God, and he was given authority to do whatever he wanted for 42 months. Free reign for three and a half years. And he spoke terrible words of blasphemy against God, slandering his name and his dwelling. That is, those who dwell in heaven. The beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. And all the people who belong to this world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. We don't want to be here when that happens. And let me tell you what else. We don't want our friends to be here 
we don't want our family to be here when this happens. Now, if you say, well, you know, Pastor Ray, that sounds pretty far out uh, to me, and I understand that. But then if you say that, you also have to ask yourself, okay, what does it mean? Why is it in the Bible? What does it mean for me? Because we can't just go through, like I said earlier, and say, okay, Matthew, let's go through the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, let's read about doctrine and Romans, and let's, and then say, but Revelations, nah, I'm just not going to look at that. Because it's there for a reason. The beast is the Antichrist. Probably more of a political leader than a religious leader. Um, and global, which is why Christians are, by and large, really apprehensive about any kind of global government, any kind of global religion. Uh, pretty apprehensive. Have you heard of the G7? The G7? You know, if, if you get seven of the most powerful nations together, they can force you to do just about anything. So it's potentially dangerous. The leopard represents Greece, Greece and Rome, the luxurious, the glory of Rome. Uh, the bear, uh, Medo-Persia, Iran maybe, large, dominant, governments not really voted in. The lion, Babylon, fierce, cruel. You don't like it? Too bad. Tough. Um, you don't want to be here during that time. And the false prophet represents the anti-spirit, the spirit of God. I saw another beast come out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. He exercised all authority of the first beast, and he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down from the earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast, who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to the statue so it could speak. And the statue of the beast commanded that everyone refusing to worship it must die. Stay with me. He required everyone to be given a mark on the right hand or the forehead. No one could buy or sell anything without a mark, which was either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Let the one understanding solve the meaning and number of the beast for the number of the man. His number is 666. Now, you know, a few years ago, you might not have believed that anything like this could happen. Um, and I'm not saying that this is the mark of the beast, so I make sure you don't misunderstand me. But the fact that you can't go in the restaurants, go to games, and do fly planes, do other things without a vaccine, lets you know that, what, that, that there is a control here that we never thought. And I'm not making a statement about vaccines either. I'm simply saying we never would have imagined how this could have happened 10 years ago. And yet today we see things that lean that direction. We used to freak out about worldwide currency, one currency. Now MasterCard can, trans can tra do all the, the figuring for you. They know, they know all of that, they can just do it. That's not even an issue anymore. You know, the time of Hitler was uh, a very scary time for the world. I don't know how up on your history that you are, but you know that World War II, a lot of people think, in a large part, hinged on one event. Do you remember? You remember uh, Stalin and um, uh, Britain with Churchill and the United States president, they're all together um, trying to figure out how they're going to win this thing. The war and and the Germans they were coming on like gangbusters and they were they were very close to winning at least that front and the Russians came in on on the Russian front and it 
and it wasn't thought that they could defeat the Germans, but a snowstorm happened. There was a tremendous weather that was there that the Germans were unprepared to deal with. Were it not for that, Germans could be ruling the world today. At least some people, history people, think that. God intervened. So if you don't think some of these things can happen, they came close to happening in the past. Uh, Satan will not come where it's real obvious. It will be obvious, I think, to some Christians who have read a lot. Maybe not so obvious for others. But he will tempt you in things that are tempting to you. Satan will tempt you with things that are tempting to you. I want to read, I, I'm reading a book called uh, God and Cancel Culture. I'm just going to read a couple things to you. Talking about systems rising in America, online and cell phone tracking, people being fired from, fired from jobs for social media posts, uh, simply expressing mainstream political views. A snitch culture which is rising fast, for instance, the next door website. Facial recognition software, the tracking of COVID positive citizens, and in some parts, church uh, registration during the pandemic. Um, Mike Bickle is part of the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. He said this, he defines rulers as influential leaders in various arenas of our culture, such as academia, the media, politics, the marketplace, finance, the military, sports, and entertainment. And this is what he says. They're going to plan and scheme to drive the influence of the word of God out of the culture. To the secular mindset, God's word is a bondage and it stifles our human potential. Old, archaic laws in the Bible that are keeping us back from our full potential in sexuality and spirituality and everywhere else. They are going to get rid of and dismiss the word of God in the public square in every way possible. That has really accelerated in the last 12 months and then much faster in the last 12 weeks, and is almost at a breathtaking speed, he said in early 2021. Have you seen any of those things happening? Then he goes on to talk about what's found in Daniel 12.4. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And then the author of this book says, my grandfather, A.R. Farley, was a Pentecostal preacher in Kansas for more than 50 years. That, by the way, is also Jody's grandfather. My grandfather could not have envisioned the internet or the fact that today you can reach people by cell phone and not even know they're halfway around the globe. He goes on to list a lot of uh, other warning signs uh, that we see in our world today. Why is that important to us? Because we need to stay sharp. We need to, we need to not let down our guard. We need to not just think everything's okay. We need to be praying. We need to be alert. We need to, we need to remember that we need to take people to heaven with us. And when you start seeing some of this, uh, it, it's, it makes you wake up and say, yeah, I got to pay more attention here. And at least that's how I think about it. The Lord is not slow to fill his, fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and all the works that are done in it will be exposed. That's found in Peter. Um, many of you may have seen our retreat from Afghanistan with people hanging on airplanes. 
and falling off of them to their death. Um, in the tribulation period, you're not going to want to be. You're going to be on. You're going to want to be on the plane that flies out, and you're going to want to be inside that plane when that event takes place. Don't wait. Don't wait. The tribulation period is not something we want to be part of. Would you stand with me? Time's up. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a moment? Just if there's anybody here that says, you know what, I'm not sure I'm on that first plane out. Uh, would you pray with me, Pastor, about that? I want to do that right now. And it's simply a prayer saying that you believe that Jesus is Lord and Savior and that you invite him. He's the one that forgives our sins and that you invite him to be Lord of your life. If there's somebody today that would say, yeah, that's me, Pastor, would you just slip your hand up? Can we all pray together? Just pray out loud with me. Dear Jesus, thank you for forgiving my sins. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, Lord, that you provide a way to heaven. I receive you as my Lord and my Savior. I'm determined to follow you every day of my life. I want to be there in heaven with you at the rapture. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And I wonder if there are others today that would say, you know what, Pastor Ray, I think I've been a little lax with, under, with just really feeling that burden of sharing my faith with others because I don't want anybody to miss going to heaven in my realm of influence. And still with eyes, heads bowed, eyes closed, if you would say, I'm going to make a brand new commitment today to, as God leads, influence people in my sphere of influence. I want to do that. Would you pray for me about that? Would you slip your hand up? Yes. Father, all across this house, good people wanting to do the very best. And Lord, we, we can't do that without you. We need your spirit. We need your guidance. We need your timing. We need to know what to say, when to say it. There's just so many things. But I pray that you would just remind us in those God moments, in those times when we have an opportunity, that you would ring that alert bell so that we, we are aware of it, we recognize it. And then, Lord, I pray you would give us just the right thing to say. Thank you, Jesus. May, may Praise Center be an influencing church in our families, in our community, and in every sphere that we are touching. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I want our entire Praise Center family to recognize each other in heaven. Amen? And, and some of you I want to see with hair, okay? Matt, come on. <laughs>